Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm really excited here to be presenting MLflow. As you are aware, if you attended the keynotes, MLflow uh, is the Databricks. Uh, MLflow in general is uh, coming out with release 1.0. Uh, that's going to be a guaranteed API and stability. Uh, just before we go on, I was wondering how many people here have actually used MLflow? Uh, okay, great. And I assume you're mostly Python users. Any Scala users of, uh, of MLflow? Oh, awesome. Interesting. Okay, great. Well, I will uh, mainly focus on the Python part, but I will also talk about the Scala part because that's actually close to my heart because I uh, worked on the initial uh, Java client API for that. So uh, I'm going to cover uh, the first five minutes uh, introduction background, and then I'm going to sort of jump into some code. I'm going to show you the basic code, how to uh, track experiments and uh, package models and so forth. So uh, as you are probably aware, MLflow is a, a big part of, uh, it's, it's a new end-to-end uh, -end machine learning pipeline that is uh, Initiated by Databricks folks, it is open source though. We have up to like about 70 contributors now, uh, committers there. It's uh, rapidly g g gaining a lot of traction from very different people. So the general design philosophy of MLflow is to be very lightweight, open APIs. Uh, it's, it's not opinionated. It's very uh, basically loose in the sense it lets you do what you want, tries to stay out of your way. And at the, uh, the most minimal part is that uh, the three components are of uh, the um, MLflow are the tracking component, the projects, and the models. So you can actually use each of these independently of one another. Uh, they, the models and the projects sort of go hand in hand. But the tracking, for example, is typically what people start with. And that's a, uh, it's a simple concept, as all of you who work, train models are aware of, uh, when you're tuning them, hyperparameter tuning, and you very quickly lose track of uh, your uh, input parameters and your output metrics. And of course, everybody has their own homegrown solution, and uh, they try their best. Uh, and this is actually precisely one of the reasons why I like ML, um, um, a solutions architect at Databricks. And one of the reasons that I'm focusing on MLflow is that in my last job before Databricks, I spent literally six, six months uh, writing something almost identical to the tracking piece. It, it, was, it was spooky when MLflow came out. I said, oh, somebody took my idea. Uh, so I'm very well aware of those problems that, you know, caught, that caused me to write this and the different, the way uh, data scientists, especially the people training, think, the way they work. And uh, one of the things I discovered was there's like no two teams that are alike. They can be radically different. For example, the team I worked with wasn't that interested in uh, numerical metrics. They were interested in plots. They wanted us to compare plots between runs and so forth. So there's different. Uh, so that's why MLflow is, tries not to be prescriptive. Uh, so the tracking component has, uh, is essentially you log, you create an experiment. An experiment is a generalized concept that reflects you know, a piece of code. There you have uh, input parameters, you have metrics, and you have artifacts. You can uh, store the uh, actual bits of the model. Those are stored. And you can store arbitrary artifacts also, like a, a plot. And uh, you have uh, freeform tags there. Then the second component is projects, which is a well-defined metadata format for you to, to define uh, the main program, the input parameters that go into that, so you can run this uh, without having the code later on. It specifies, for example, a conda YAML file, and then you have, there's a command, an MLflow CLI, or through the MLflow API, you can then execute those bits that are stored, that you stored in the tracking component. Uh, and you can actually run it against your local MLflow code or against a GitHub repo. So you actually don't have to have the code. All you have to know is the repo URI, and you just uh, specify the input parameters, and you execute that code. I, I find that really cool. That's really useful. And then the last part there are the models. So uh, those are model flavors. Um, 
you know, scikit-learn, every model uh, toolkit has its own uh, favorite serialization format. So with MLflow, we support, I think, seven uh, formats out of the box. It's a pluggable uh, custom API. You can add your own if you want to. So you can uh, scikit-learn, you save it as a pickle. Uh, you know, PySpark, Spark, uh, Scala, Spark, you could save it as um, Spark ML format. And uh, we are also, we also support MLeap. MLeap is, uh, for those who, of you who have not heard about it, it's an open source project that uh, allows for interoperable models between different languages. Uh, it's, uh, Databricks actually has, um, is increasing its support for that. In fact, it's, I believe in 5.3, it's the preferred format for saving Spark models. Uh, I will show an example of that too. So, Having said that, I am going to skip all this stuff and um, jump into the code. So, oh yeah, I forgot to send that link out there. I'm sorry. Okay. So for those of you who are, um, I'm going to leave this up for a while here, this uh, bit.ly link. If you guys want to just uh, grab that, uh, that'll give you a link to this document that you're looking at. And then here, this is the link. Uh, I put together a GitHub site for this session today with uh, sample code. So if anybody wants to uh, be coding, you can uh, look at the, um, the readme. You'll just need to uh, create a virtual environment, a pip install, uh, MLflow. And the, the instructions are uh, uh, all there uh, here. The, probably not enough time to to get into all of this, but you can subsequently after class or during the break, if you have any questions, you know, it's pretty simple to set up. Uh, this is how you launch a local server on your own uh, laptop. So the MLflow tracking server is simply a web server. It's a Flask server that you can either run on your local machine, you can run it anywhere, uh, and you specify uh, two places where to store the run metadata and the actual artifact uh, data here. Oh, uh, zoom in? Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Okay, is that better? Yeah. So to get started, you, you kick off your server in one window, and um, you uh, set this environment variable uh, to point to it. And lo and behold, the next step then we can go over to uh, Hello World, which is like super simple. Hello world is, come on internet. Right, so this is a very simple example here. Uh, I'm going to show the code here. Uh, Maybe can, can just open a doc and copy the GitHub link and blow it up like in size 25 or so. A lot of people at the back are trying to copy the GitHub link. Yeah, uh, copy the bit. This guy. Yeah, if you can just make that like size 25 or something. Size 25? Like this? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good, good suggestion. Um, so here in this example, uh, let's try to keep that there. Uh, right. So as you see here, you essentially import MLflow here, line four. Uh, we're going to be using this um, uh, Python context uh, manager concept here. So within the scope of that block there, uh, a run is created and then a run is closed. Uh, as you see here, this is the run context here. You can look up in the documentation all the different parameters, but there's essentially a, a run UI, UUID and so forth, and here's where we essentially log a parameter. A parameter can be anything you want. It's a string. You can log any number of parameters. Uh, metrics, those are floats. And a tag is just a free form uh, thing you can associate with it. Here, I'm just showing an example of how to log an artifact. This is an arbitrary, it can be anything. It can be a blob, a text file. So you simply create a local file 
and then you uh, import that into, uh, you log that as an artifact. Here is a, just an alternate way of doing this. This is just came out in uh, 091 log batch. It's a more efficient way of uh, uh, logging the, the params, metrics, and tags. It's an alternate way. So it's pretty self-evident. And that's basically it uh, in terms of uh, now, just to show you how that will end up looking, if we go to um, the, uh, the UI. So MLflow has a pretty nice basic UI here. Uh, here we see on the left a list of all your experiments. And uh, here uh, we're going to look at the Hello World experiment. And uh, you can see here that um, we have, uh, they're sorted by, you can sort them by date. Here we have um, the parameters and the metrics. Oh, I forgot to mention version. So version is actually the GitHub commit hash. And that's automatically, if you're in a GitHub project, that's automatically uh, uh, stored for you. And the source is, uh, you know, that's your piece of code there. So you can see, you can sort here. We can find the best uh, RMSE. They're all the same in this case. Uh, and let's just drill down into a um, into the run itself. So the run ID is a magical number, a magical string here, UUID, basic information. Here are the parameters. Uh, and since we didn't store an artifact, we don't have one here yet. So uh, now I will go next into the uh, into a real example, uh, as opposed to Hello World. We'll start off with good old scikit-learn, uh, sklearn. Yes? People are seeing some issues with accessing the Bitly link. It can only be accessed by Databricks employees. OK. Uh, is I'll just get, give the, uh, okay. the yeah, yeah, uh, the, yeah. The best thing is just go to this GitHub site. You can just uh, Google it. It's, it's better to just Google it if you don't can't copy it. It's. Uh, if you look for Spark, ML, this, this guy, Google will probably come up with it really quickly. And my uh, little initials here. That should be the fastest way to get here, actually. That's really all you need. There's nothing else uh, for this presentation in that document. There's some subsequent information. So, uh, so here's, uh, like I said, scikit-learn. We're uh, going to um, uh, show you here the... Um, uh, the, this is a, a real example. I have to go here into wine quality. This is the standard wine quality. So um, here's a, uh, a class, a trainer class here. So uh, as you noticed, I'm going to skip all over all the non-MLflow stuff because that, that's all not germane to this talk. So here's our good old friend, the run context. Uh, you can specify a whole bunch of uh, parameters here to your run, like a run name, a source name, and so forth. Here you can see I'm storing uh, the, uh, the parameters again, you know, the alpha and the L1 ratio. Here are the three metrics I decided to uh, choose. And then I'm just stuffing a whole bunch of interesting stuff uh, as tags here. And here I am storing the actual bits of the model uh, and here I'm storing a, uh, creating a, um, uh, up an artifact for the, the plot here. So when I run that, for example, you can see here, um, SK learn, if we go here to, to a sample, you can see the artifacts here where we have the model. It's a well-defined model here. Uh, this is, uh, the flavor, uh, there's always a, something called Python function flavor, which is uh, there for Py PyFunk, which is a, a nice utility uh, to allow you to generically execute Python uh, scripts. And then this is the actual uh, SK learn format here. And uh, here's the conda file associated with it. That's the actual pickle file. And then here is our friend, the just a chart that we created. Uh, and so that's, that's basically, you know, 
sort of the key components here uh, of that. So when I go here now, I'm going to show you if I can just come up with this. Um, you know, this looks so small all at once now here. So I have in that, if, you, if you, anybody has a chance to get to the GitHub site, uh, I put together uh, in each of these folders something called a playbook. So uh, similar to the readme code, but it actually executes. So here are ex here's an example of running. So the basic way, you know, this is a standard Python way that you're executing your custom code like that. Uh, and then here's where it gets interesting. Uh, when I go over to, uh, we have this, uh, these are managed runs here with the MLflow CLI. So you can see in this case, I'm specifying a GitHub site. I don't have to be in this directory. I don't have to have you know, this checklist cloned or anything. Just executing a remote URI with those parameters. And uh, lo and behold, that ends up in the, the server there. Uh, and uh, like I said, there was a version. Yeah, this is a, a similar version that just runs against the current code. Dot, it's exactly the same as the other one. And then there's a third option, which is uh, you can run this against a Databricks cluster. So you develop your code here. You uh, execute this exact same code with an extra spec file that defines the cluster you want it to run on, and it will run as a well-managed uh, Databricks job. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with that. And here's an example of predicting. Uh, there's several ways, like I mentioned. This is this code here um, runs against um, the PyFunk. Uh, let me actually bring that uh, up there. Hello world is not, okay, where's too many windows in my life here. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, that's not going to work. Right, so uh, here we have uh, SK Learn. Do, 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 do. So, so you see here there's several uh, ways to, here's the code for predictions. Uh, it's very simple. You read in a data file, you get it, you instantiate a, a client. This is, um, MLflow has two basic uh, APIs for you to work with. The basic one is just called MLflow package. That's the key stuff that you need to track experiments. MLflow tracking is a little bit more advanced. It will list experiments, get run info, and so forth. So here I'm getting uh, the uh, URI for the model itself. And then I'm uh, loading it into PyFunk, this uh, MLflow method here that loads the model and then runs the predictions there. So this is, like I mentioned, the, the generic way to do things. So there's obviously, in case of, um, here's a more like a side kit, uh, learn-oriented way to predict the model. So here we're loading it as a side kit load model. So we don't have to specify any URIs there. We just specify the relative path that we saved it under, give it the run ID, and uh, then we just run uh, this, uh, the prediction on it, and we can see the predictions. And my favorite one, which I really actually, believe it or not, I, have a, I love this one. This is a, uh, enables you to run this as a UDF, as a Spark UDF here with just one line of code. I mean, isn't that amazing? You don't have to you know, go through all the hassle of creating your own UDF, figuring it out, loading it, and so forth. Just one line. So note that this is a scikit-learn model. This is not a Spark model. But you know, with this uh, magic underneath here, it loads underneath the hood that that UDF is executing a scikit-learn uh, code and giving you the result here. So. That's uh, really convenient. You know, for example, let's say you want to score a million client uh, you know, requests. You, know, you get a whole bunch of uh, user, whatever your algorithm is. This you know, really plays well into the batch pipeline there. And so here are examples how to do that. 
you know, the, the call is the same. You just specify a, uh, a uh, magical run ID and then the, the, the file name in this case. And so, you know, and here's the Spark. Uh, this was the one that runs the UDF. So in, in case you want to try this, you'll need to install Spark on your local machine. Uh, so forth. So it's a little bit, the format's a little bit off. But yeah, um, that's uh, basically that for uh, scikit-learn. Uh, I can also uh, go over and um, actually show you the one then for, um, uh, say, the next one I wanted to highlight was the uh, PySpark. So th this is PySpark. You know, similar concept here. This is using, you know, Databricks uh, uh, Spark ML under the hood, uh, and uh, similar concept here. Run the prediction here, and I can also show you the, the code for that. It's uh, uh, where is this guy? This would be here. Pi Spark. So the, the PySpark code is, uh, you know, it's tiny. Uh, oops, this is the predict, right? I wanted to show the, yeah, let's just, I can show you the predict, yeah. So the predict is, you know, simple. You just read a data frame, uh, and you load your model here, Spark model, Spark load model, and then you just uh, run the transform method and your predictions, and that's it. And the, uh, the training is, is, is analogous. You know, it's the same. Uh, it's the same uh, ML flow code here. We start with a run here. I'm calling that, and then in the trainer here, uh, you can see I'm doing log logging my parameters, max depth, and max bins, and uh, then I'm logging the metrics here and logging the model here. Uh, and there's also this, there was an attempt, I tried to do this for MLEAP. For some reason, I couldn't get it to work on my laptop. This, of course, this works um, subsequently. Ricardo's going to show an example of that in a notebook where I'm saving the model in Spark format, mo Spark ML format, and in MLEAP format, and then, re you know, predicting from either one. So that's pretty cool there. So, okay. So any questions so far? And before I go on to the next part, uh, okay. And lastly, I will show the um, the the uh, Spark code, uh, the uh, Scala code. So our um, main focus in the initial phases of MLflow was on Python because the, the bit the Bitly link. Okay. Here, this guy here. If you can, you have no permission. We updated it. Yeah, we you can try it again, and uh, all the code that I'm showing is at this um, link here underneath. That, that's my piece. There's other information in that doc also. So, uh, and then uh, so yeah. So our initial um, uh, focus is on Python. That was the first pass because most machine learning. People use Python, or very many. Uh, but we also have a Java API. So we created a, a just like Python, there's a Python API for MLflow tr tracking. We have also an equivalent a Java API, which can be called from Java or Scala. So that, that's why it was written in Java. Um, it's uh, not as well documented as the Python stuff, but there is Java docs. There's, you know, out in Maven, there is a, um, uh, there's a, uh, you know, a jar. You can go, go and download it. Uh, and here's the, the example uh, for, uh, I put together, uh, like, two examples. Here's Hello World, let's say. This is, like I said, it doesn't do much, but it just gives you a flavor for the, for the API. So here you go. Uh, this is my utils underneath. I can show you afterwards. But this is just creates a client. Um, this, uh, since the API isn't as rich as the Python one, I had to create some of these wrapper functions here, like get or create experiment ID. So this is like set experiment in a sense. 
uh, if, for you who are familiar, this either creates an experiment or returns an existing one. And um, here I'm logging, I'm creating a run here. I pass in the experiment ID that it belongs to. This is the name of my file here, source file. This is, you know, same as Python. There's no difference here. Uh, right now, since the project piece uh, doesn't exist in uh, um, Scala, Java, uh, there is no log model. So we don't manage models in the Java API yet. I mean, that is coming. So here, what we do is we can store, store things as an artifact. So here, I'm just storing a normal ar artifact. And here is my, uh, uh, wait a second. Yeah, right, log artifacts. Wait, wait a second. Where am I storing my model? Oh, no, there is no model here. Dummy, sorry. <laughs> yeah, there's no, there's no trainer here yet. So let's go right away then to the uh, more interesting one so I can show you that. Uh, here is the um, decision tree that uh, actually uh, log artifact. Right, so you can see here I'm storing here, this is a utility function, save, I'm saving the model as a Spark ML, as an mleap, and that should be up here, that little function that, um, no, no, that, that's in the uh, utils. Uh, but anyway, the, the, those are wrappers around, uh, mleap has some sort of gnarly syntax to save things, so I immediately wrap that up. And so this is the same, you know, same idea, a little bit behind the API in terms of uh, functionality, but we, you know, there are lots of folks actually using this uh, at large scale, uh, you know, logging hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, runs against their experiments, you know, for those people who prefer to work with Scala. And there's also um, an R API. One of the, um, since um, Emberflow is open source, uh, I, I believe it was one of the uh, R Studio employees who actually, if you go out to the open source site, you'll see there's a huge amount of uh, R uh, code there. There's an API and so forth. I'm not an R person, so I just didn't have cycles to do it. But uh, so we support R, Scala, and Python. And uh, OK. So if there's no more questions, I'm going to go over into some of the other concepts here that we sort of uh, skipped over. For example, uh, here was the, um, the concept of what we mentioned was a uh, MLflow project. So he here's the metadata that powers the MLflow run command. Um, this is a YAML syntax. It's pretty self-evident. Uh, you describe here uh, your parameters that you expect to the run command. Uh, and you know, there's richness there. You know, you can give it a type, you can give it defaults, and then that command itself there, the command uh, tells you exactly the Python code that you would invoke, how that works. So, is that a question? No? Okay, yeah. So th th this is like super important, this, this, this file here, it can get quite, a, you know, you can have multiple entry points. So I have one command here. You could have multiple different commands. And in your MLflow run command, you would specify which one you want to be executed. Uh, and uh, here is actually a more, let's see, I think it was the, uh, the Python one, the PySpark one, had more substance to it. Uh, ML project. Nope, that was the Java one, I'm sorry, the, the Scala one. Uh, Scala, Scala. Oh, no, there isn't one, sorry. I'm confusing that with another project. Okay, but anyway, uh, that's uh, essentially, you know, what it looks like here. If you have a chance, you know, you can download this code. It should work out of the box. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, that's a YAML file? Oh, yeah, yeah, yet another markup language. Yeah, yeah, that's a YAML file there. Um, yes? So, um, once you define the ML project, uh, once you define the ML project, 
Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was, uh, in, 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 okay. Here's an example of, uh, if we go to this window here, there's this command called mlflow run here. So th this is a, um, a, a CLI. So, you know, the run command takes an argument, which is either, I believe there's a dot here. There was a local, well, no, this is, this can take either the, if you use a dot, it runs against the local code. And these are the parameters that uh, were reflected in the uh, YAML file, if, if, if you re recall. So it expects, you know, dot dash P is uh, one of you, your user parameters. So like I mentioned, this is really cool because this allows for reproducibility. This is one of the most important things, you know, in machine learning is like you want to come two months later and be able to run the exact same bits. So we, we store the source code, the, the, the git commit hash, and uh, the parameters too. So you could literally take, uh, you know, a run and go back and execute it and get the same value. Y yes? Yes. Yeah, yeah. If you have to use a, a default parameter, if you specified one, it, you don't have to, you can skip it. It's optional. Yes. No, it, it will take, if you don't specify a value, it will take the default value from the YAML file and then store it in the, in the database. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, pretty basic here. So I'm gonna just jump into some interesting stuff. So this is all like super basic and um, it's pretty, you know, it's very easy to get started. Well, what I wanted to show you, what, uh, since I've spent a lot of time you know, playing around with these APIs, that you can get quite, uh, with the MLflow tracking uh, uh, API, you can do a lot of interesting things here. So I'm gonna show you here. This is one of the things that doesn't really exist now in MLflow, and a lot of people sort of wonder, how can I do it, why it doesn't exist? So how do you get the best run? Let's say you have a million runs in your experiment. Now you're ready to deploy this. Well, you know, we have an API. You can go out and query per metric, but it's still pretty manual. So here I'm going to show you how to do that and uh, show you some of the caveats, some of the uh, problems or issues right now. So we have a, um, like here, uh, we have, you know, you can look at the, uh, the Python documentation. So I'm going to show you first, like, the naive approach with somebody, let's say, will come in and look at the API and says, let me get started quickly. So this is uh, taking an experiment ID, a metric name, and then this is min or max. Um, so I basically get all the runs for a given experiment. So this is an info object, and this returns just the top-level information for the experiment. It does not, re uh, for the run, uh, for the runs. It doesn't give me the metrics or the params, okay? So that's sort of unfortunate, uh, it's, but that's the way it is. So then we have to iterate over that and get uh, the actual, uh, here we get the, all the run details. So this is a separate call, and if you notice, if you start having thousands or millions of runs, that's gonna, that's, that's a HTTP call, and that's just gonna crawl, that's gonna slow down. But, you know, that's the most self-evident way. And then here's just the common code that uh, grabs, that, that, you know, computes, gets the best one, whether it's min or max. Then here's a, a different way, as I was poking around the API, as I discovered, well, we have a, a nice search method, a search method that there's some nice limited syntax, SQL-like syntax, and you can get information, let's say, like get me the smallest parameter, get me the largest parameter. Uh, I'm sorry, get me a parameter larger than a given value. Unfortunately, there's no min or max, which I need. <laughs> so what I did, I'm um, sort of, this is, you can call it a hack, or it's just a clever way to use it, I basically get all the information. So this method fortunately returns me all the information for each for the run, for the runs, whatever uh, the um, constraint is. Since I don't specify a constraint here, you know, syntax here like RMSC less than two, I'm going to get it all. And I, that's, lo and behold, magic. I can in one call get this and compute it. Now the downside, of course, is 
that'll b explode if I have too many runs. And uh, we have, you know, a feature request for adding functions within the search syntax, so that will be executed on the server side. So, you know, that, that's sort of a nice little convenience uh, way to uh, run things. And lastly, I will show you another, I mean, it's not rocket science, but it's, it's just, you know, the API is quite, uh, uh, it's quite rich and you can do a lot. I mean, I, I think people are actually putting together their own uh, UIs, you know, on top of uh, the Emma Flow API. So here's just uh, information, just to dump a run, for example. I uh, see this. this it's the same dump run. Yeah, yeah this is, uh, I get a run and I dump um, here in the, in the um, uh, basically getting a client here. I'm getting the run information that I'm calling this dump here. And this is where the dump utility, you can see here, where I recurse down into all its uh, members there, print out the metrics, the data params, uh, so, you know, I can, from the API, for me, I find this very convenient. You know, from the API, I can uh, then see, like here, you know, here's a sample uh, run. This is all the information for a run. So, you know, it's not rocket science, but it's, it's sort of, I, I find this useful because the run UUIDs are like synthetic. So, you know, they're just very hard to remember. So this is... Okay, I think that's 40 minutes, right? Is uh, we have time for some questions, maybe, or any any questions or comments? Yes. You mentioned that uh, it's probably possible to, uh, to compare experiments by graphs, not by. Metrics. No, no, we don't have that. Uh, you, we have graphing there, but there is no. I mean, we can compare runs. Yeah, I can actually. I mean, I can show you what we have there in terms of, uh, so if, if I go to like uh, this experiment here, I can actually um, compare between runs. So I'm gonna select two runs here. Let's see, are they different? Yeah. And then I'm gonna compare them. So this is comparing the metrics here. And then there's a basic graph here that graphs the two. Um, it's not rocket science, but you know it's an open source project, so we're always looking for people to help out or you make comments. You know, the, the GitHub issues is a great place to. There's a Slack channel too for open source, so any of these ideas are more than happy.